was glad to see this overwhelming turnout. <laughs> but that's all right. Um, maybe we'll get more uh, talked about this way. Okay. Hey, <clears throat> Well, Murray uh, Solomon, the, the, uh, who was uh, masterminded this, this, this week, uh, has said that we're going to talk about why does, do people have to wait two hours for, um, in student health service, which isn't a bad place to begin. Uh, and to vastly oversimplify the matter, but dramatize it, uh, I think the underlying reason is that there are perhaps only 65 to 75 percent of the staff needed to take care of the expectable needs of a student body of 30,000 students. Uh, there are just too few uh, people, rooms, uh, resources uh, to handle the, the demand and expectable load. Uh, so even though the existing staff is, uh, is truly busy, and anybody who has worked there for even sat around uh, waiting knows that the uh, staff aren't by and large um, knitting or, or uh, holding long wraps with each other. Uh, and even though we see somewhere between six and 800 total student visits a day, which is an awful lot of, of uh, patients, and incidentally, when I tell that to anybody in the medical school, they go white. You know, uh, almost any talk that has existed about, well, maybe the medical school should take this over, this kind of thing. Uh, you say, okay, you're ready to, to handle uh, that kind of visits, and they, they just, it boggles them. Uh, they deal largely in more consultative types of complicated cases, and. Um, a clinic load of maybe a, a, a hundred is, is uh, a big, big load. <clears throat> so, um, there are just too few of us trying to serve too many uh, of you. And any time you have this situation, you are bound to have some delays. Uh, you're bound to have uh, individual patient contact by the time you get to see the health professional, you're bound to have it be shorter and perhaps more impersonal or less personal uh, than it would be if more time were available for each person. Now, um, okay, up, up until a few years ago, I think the situation was even perhaps worse than it is now. Uh, in those times not too long ago, as recently as 1969-70, uh, the service uh, was pretty well philosophically organized along the, quotes, traditional doctor's office line, uh, in which the nurse and the attendant were basically uh, merely uh, attendants or, or uh, handmaidens or uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, companions of some kind and, and performing certain tasks if ordered, but every patient uh, uh, was required to see the doctor. Now, uh, any of you know that if you've got a, uh, if you've stuck a, a splinter badly into your finger, you can't get it out, and maybe uh, it looks a little bit red, but not really too bad. You want to get it out. And uh, to go in and wait for two hours and finally get to see uh, a physician who uh, either pulls it out rapidly or, or implies that, well, this is a silly thing to, to waste time on and so forth, that this is an absolutely infuriating thing. Or that <coughs> uh, the person who has a mild sore throat, they're not all that sick, but they've got exams coming up, they've got papers coming up, they've got obligations and things scheduled, and they damn well don't want it to get worse, uh, and would like somebody to, to cast a, a judicious and preventive uh, eye on it, again, is, uh, is not too happy at having to wait two hours, uh, only to spend two or three minutes uh, uh, with the doctor. 
So, about two years ago, uh, uh, an internal change was made, and this I use simply to illustrate some of the kinds of changes you can make within an existing staff to serve people better. And this was essentially the upgrading and retraining of nurses, of some of the nurses, to do more than they had been allowed to do before, and that is to exercise some independent clinical judgment. Now, I don't believe, in fact, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, from experience around the country that most students, uh, provided they feel the attention they get is fairly prompt, fairly efficient, and seems appropriate to what their expectations were, they don't really care much who gives it. In other words, if uh, the nurse uh, reacts uh, <clears throat> confidently and appropriately and, and uh, uh, in, renders the kind of, of judgment or decision or opinion or treatment that uh, the student expects, in uh, 99 out of 100 cases, uh, students are quite satisfied with that. They do not usually insist, well, you're just a nurse, I, I've got to see the doctor, particularly if this has been handled, as I say, uh, fairly promptly and well. I'd be interested in any counter-reactions to that or people, but this is certainly my impression. Uh, by training eight nurses and assigning two of them in rotation at all times with one doctor to the so-called primary clinic, uh, I think we have saved many students uh, with relatively uh, uncomplicated or uh, relatively minor things, saved them the extra hassle of having to wait and fight their way through uh, uh, on a routine basis to the doctor. And those nurses are now seeing about 30% of all the, the uh, clinic load without uh, having to go to the doctor. This saves the doctor's time for the more complicated or, or the more uh, uh, obscure kinds of cases. Now, uh, this is one example of an internal program change where you say we're, we're going to have different people we're going to spread this work around among different people, and we're going to use paraprofessionals wherever we can. Now, uh, uh, this has helped, uh, and further moves in this direction will be, I think, still further helpful when we can do them. Now, another kind of internal change that may uh, uh, loosen things up, may speed things up, and may uh, make the kinds of service that most students need most of the time more readily available will be somehow to shift the emphasis now placed on the so-called specialty clinics. Uh, not that they're not needed or not that such functions aren't needed. Uh, when you need a hematologist, you need a hematologist. When, uh, uh, if you've got something definitely wrong with uh, uh, with your thyroid uh, and it's complicated at all, then you, you do need to have access to a competent specialist. Uh, I think one of my serious questions is whether the present way of doing it, that is of the use of a large amount of space, a large amount of nursing time, uh, and essentially one whole side of the health service, whether its use um, for this kind of, of purpose uh, is really uh, as effective as it would be perhaps to make an arrangement for some of the clinics with, say, a medical school department or uh, a, a practice group within the school and simply refer those patients there, thus loosening up some of the nursing time, some of the space uh, to provide more general and direct kinds of services. Um, these are the kinds of maneuvers that without a lot of budget change or a lot of, of personnel additions uh, can somewhat ameliorate or somewhat improve the, the, uh, the problem. And as I say, I come back to the point that uh, probably 80% uh, of all the visits of students to a student health service in a year are not for the fancy or the specialized or the highly 
uh, esoteric things, they're for the ordinary things that bother most of us. And it's uh, there that the bottleneck comes and there that the major problem comes. So I think we can achieve some strengthening of general clinic, primary clinic, as against the, uh, and still provide specialty services by referral or other mechanisms to those who really need them. Right now, a lot of the, the specialists are really handling overflow, if you will, from the general clinic. Uh, in other words, many of them will say, well, about half the cases or a third of the cases I see really would not need to be referred to me if there were time for a good general physician to take care of them. And, of course, now the way the appointment system, the way uh, the time slots work, if you're going to overflow in that way, you usually have to make another appointment, another visit, and uh, uh, this doubles your total trippage back and forth. Whereas perhaps if there were more generalists, more time for them, uh, some of those visits could be, could be saved, which is a saving of time and money to you. <coughs> now, uh, even if, if these things are done, uh, I think the improvements will be uh, probably visible to those who frequent the place and who, uh, uh, and to quite a few individual students. But I would guess that still they, there will be weights in there. In other words, you can't cure the whole situation that way. All right, uh, where do you get more money? Or for more staff, for, for expansion. Uh, we can maybe make space, we can maybe uh, save some nursing time so we can call that money, if you will. Um, what about the hospital situation? Now, uh, here, even though we are paying for an inadequate amount of hospital time, three days, uh, when I say inadequate, um, the average hospital stay, as you may or may not know, is closer to four and a half days or five days. Uh, we subsidize three and then cross our fingers, uh, if you will, hoping that the student has either some insurance that his family or his employer has held for him or that he has bought the supplemental UCLA insurance. And if he hasn't, he is theoretically on his own and out in the cold. Um, in practice, what happens at that point is that everybody agonizes and there's a lot of running up and down stairs and, and uh, uh, generally, we wind up paying it anyway. Uh, we had a recent case of a student who required major surgery, uh, was in the hospital eight days, no insurance, no covering, no dough, uh, foreign student, and uh, morally, we really had no choice but to extend the coverage uh, beyond the three days in that case. And this happens often enough uh, to pose a problem. So uh, while we're, we're subsidizing an inadequate number of days, it still uh, costs us a lot of money to serve these complicated needs for a relative minority of students. Uh, roughly 300, to f between three and 400 students per year are admitted to, to hospital. Uh, and that is opposed, that's per year. And uh, that works out to be about 1% uh, of the uh, student population. Whereas probably um, 90,000 student visits are made to the student health center a year. So there is what I mean when I say we're paying a lot of money to uh, pay for the complicated needs of, of a 1%. Uh, <clears throat> these 400 odd admissions and the three hospital days uh, work out to uh, something in the, in the order of $200,000 a year. Now with $200,000 put in another use, uh, one can buy a good deal of, of good general physician help, good nurse help, and so forth. Uh, 
Meanwhile, what to do about hospitalization? How do we cover that? Uh, can we say because it's only 1% of students get admitted a year that we'll, we'll forget it, that we're not going to do anything? I don't think we can do that. People just uh, uh, won't put up with it. The results are the penalties for, for having no provisions at all are too, too serious, too severe. Um, a person might get away with nursing their own cold or their own sore throat, but with an appendix or with a, a bad pneumonia or with a fractured femur, uh, they have no choice. They, they need the care. Uh, now, a lot of people uh, have existing hospital insurance, either through their families, uh, maybe one, of, one or both parents are employed and have an insurance plan which includes uh, a student dependent. Uh, many students work uh, in addition to being students and through their employers have some kind of hospital insurance. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I'm just trying to lay the, the groundwork, yeah. Um, I don't have a figure as to how, what percent accurately of the student body is already so, so covered, but um, the guesstimate is that maybe 70 percent uh, are so covered. Uh, an additional uh, 15 to 20 percent purchase the UCLA supplemental insurance. Uh, this leaves uninsured maybe 10 to 15 percent, something in that order. And it's remarkable uh, with the frequency with which it's this group that has the serious uh, auto accident or the, the serious illness. Now, um, our support comes largely at this point from the reg fee as you probably know. Uh, reg fee is, is at present the only uh, officially recognized way of taxing all students for student activities that should be available to all students. And uh, years and years ago, uh, when medicine and health care were a lot less complicated and a lot less expensive, uh, a an acceptable degree uh, of service was, was able to be fitted within that framework. But now, uh, still stuck, if you will, are still pretty well determined in, in our size and scope by the reg fee concept. Uh, that fee um, is simply no longer able uh, to purchase in total, the kinds of services that we think students should have and that students think they should have. Uh, and I don't really, frankly, see much chance uh, of this radically changing as long as the reg fee remains the sole uh, proprietor or arbiter uh, for student health services. Um, I think, obviously, it's got a necessary and important contribution. But um, aside from adjustment of maybe, a, a, okay, $25 roughly per student per quarter now from reg fee goes to health service. Uh, that $25 per student per quarter, I say, is no longer able to buy adequate hospitalization, fails by about 25 to 30 percent of meeting the common ambulatory or, or health service needs of the majority of students. Um, and maybe you can expand it or change it by three or four dollars per student. I would even have my uh, doubts about that when one has to compete with all of the other things that are funded by the reg fee. So I think what I'm saying, I don't know all the precise answers to this, but, but as I look down the road ahead, that uh, if what is wanted and what is needed, as I believe, is uh, a more uh, appropriate, more adequate uh, service, both in terms of quality and in quantity, with some guarantee of adequate protection against the major hospital loss, then I think we're going to have to look to some kind of uh, mechanism through which 
uh, those students who are not insured against hospitalization will be uh, required or assisted or both in obtaining hospital insurance and that some regular fund, uh, again, presumably from students, but as time goes on, may be increasingly helped by government. In other words, it's student money, but the money may come to them through through the government, either such as Medi-Cal or federal programs. But some money over and above the, the reg fee allocation, uh, or we're going to remain, uh, not only where we are, but because things get more expensive and expectations increase, we'll probably functionally go backwards. Now, with that for, uh, with that for background, uh, why don't we have some questions? Yeah. I was in the dental services uh, about two days ago, and uh, this dentist there said that they were losing a thousand dollars a month, and that he was only donating the services to appease the students, and that that services only was on an emergency type basis. And he was like. Uh, Tell him that you know, what, am I, what was I doing there if I wasn't in an emergency case? So, so um, you know, he was preaching to me that you know I shouldn't even be there at all. You know? Well, again, I think th this is this is a vivid example of of the of the squeeze you get into between too little for too many. You know, I mean. Uh, to, to, to say you can really offer a, a, a dental service that, that affects or reaches majority needs with, um, yeah, you know, four or five part-time dentists and four or five, you know, no way, no way you're going to do that. And so what you have to do is to say, all right, we will treat only a certain kind of case or a certain kind of person. We'll do a means test and, and, you know, only take the needy or this kind of thing. Now, uh, because in... The question is, what are the responsibilities of the dental care service? I don't know. In other words, the guy that they... <coughs> they, they are supposed to be for emergency care available to any student uh, and additional care, restorative work, uh, on the basis of apparent student need, uh, financial and dental, um, on a catch-as-can basis. In other words, it's uh, uh, to some degree who gets their f fussest with the mostest and, and fills up the time and pays for it. The um, subsidized portion of the program really only supports one part-time director and the uh, administrative assistant who sort of uh, sees that the whole thing goes. And the rest of the staff are supposed to be self-supporting on the basis of the fees. In other words, uh, um, that's a little sidelight. The, the income disappears somewhere. Uh, or the, in, the more income we make, then the less reg fee gives us because they say, well, you're making this money, so y you don't need so much from us. But meanwhile, uh, e the students get asked to pay more separate fees. And I'm not sure this is what they want. Like this guy, all he did was, you know, he looked in my mouth without washing his hands, you know. Uh, and he said, well, that'll be $3. And he didn't do anything else. So I'm just questioning. Uh, $3, I don't know what for, you know. So, uh, and then, you know, his attitude was very... Like he was you know, patronizing me for you know, his services. So I was well, he okay. He probably figured that three bucks was little enough uh, to pay for an exam. Uh, you know, uh, he probably would have charged twenty-five in his own office. Uh, he says, so, so he probably say, "What are you? What are you complaining about? Huh? What are you complaining about?" Uh, well, I know what you're complaining about, and as I say, I think the answer is that. Um, uh, here's a, a handful of dental people um, implying that they're going to offer any student some kind of service. 
which they can't do, so they have to restrict. And they begin to restrict on basis of judgment about how needy you are, how needy you're not. And if he doesn't figure you're too needy, looks in there, this guy isn't really, he's not in tough shape. So what do you, what do you come in here for? We got things that we're too busy. You know, we, we can't be bothered with you. Uh, it's wrong, but that's, I mean, that's the reason. So the majority of emergency cases and treats are foreign students, you know, which, you know, they get treated hand and foot, you know, which is all right. You know, as long as it stands to the, you know, the nationals, too. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. That, he was really bragging about that, you know, like, well, a year he treated three foreign students and did a complete whatever he did, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know. But, I mean, he was really proud of that. And your feeling is that he should be uh, uh, equally proud of uh, rendering... <laughs> no, my feeling is that, you know, uh, like he was preaching to me like he was my father and I was his son. You know? and, uh, like he said, well, for your information, bright boy, you know, that's, that's what he said. Uh -huh. Some big tall dude. You know. <laughs> big tall dude, yeah. White hair. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What, another question I'd like to ask you is, how much uh, in-kind service are you applying for? Are you, do you have any? How much what? In-kind service. In-kind service? I'm not sure what you mean. Voluntary financial support, or, or um, yeah, um, like from uh, the professionals there at the hospital. So. Oh, from the professionals within the hospital. Uh, all right. Um, at the present time, virtually, uh, if a student patient has a major surgical operation, appendectomy, or um, use that as a as an example uh, it is costing perhaps uh, twenty dollars the reason being that the surgeon is accepting a fixed and relatively low retainer regardless of how many patients he sees regardless of how many operations he d does now, if he goes through a month with no no operations, he he can be said to be making a below average, well below average fee for being on call and seeing some scheduled patients. If he does one, he's he's already um, virtually giving the operation for nothing and, and if he does four or five they you know the price comes down I figured to uh, where you're getting about a, a five buck appendectomy uh, most of the uh, of the consultants especially the consultants are um, giving their service on a retainer basis for considerably less uh, than they would be making for spending equal time anywhere else uh, if you don't offer them anything, uh, you don't get them. Um, if you go on a, re on a straight referral basis, we will refer them all out. Then you run into uh, a situation where the, where the doctor says, well, I don't mind giving th this service, uh, but if, if I give it, then the department cannot afford to keep going because our hospital rent costs and so forth are too great. Um, I think it's kind of unrealistic uh, to re expect large numbers uh, of doctors to reliably be on hand and spend adequate time with pa any patient referred to them uh, on a, a totally gratis basis. Uh, it just, uh, oh, the medical school doctors uh, take care, so supposedly, of the medical students uh, at no professional charge. But they don't keep records either, and uh, there's no continuity. It's not very good care. Yeah? Uh, isn't there, are there certain procedures in hospitals where the attending physicians rotate through outpatient and clinic departments? Um, is it, does this happen here in, in UCLA? Yeah, yeah. Now, why couldn't they be incorporated routinely to rotate through the student health service as part of, say, do they do this on a month, 
you know, basis. There's some kind of rotating schedule that's set up on this, I assume. So could not the Student Health Service be incorporated in this? Well, in, in a sense it is. In other words, that, that many of our consultants are people from the faculty who rotate through. But um, in, in, in turn for that, that's an extra rotation. It's not, um, uh, it's not, if you will, originally part of their uh, paid duties. And uh, in general, somebody has to, has to pay for it. Now, as I say, I think we pay probably less than, than a lot of places would. Um, I now, for instance, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, I have paid them a, a really a ridiculously small amount of, of money um, in return for their assurance that they will provide four hours of gynecologist time to us a week, uh, which is about four hours we don't have scheduled. Um, that's four months ago, and they can't find anybody in the department to do it. They're all busy with what they thought they came there originally to do. Um, so uh, I think what I'm saying is that, that to, to depend on, on free service uh, on the medical school doctors because they're there is unrealistic. It doesn't work out. And I think also to spend large amounts of money out of the basic reg fee for some of this is also uh, beside the point. I would hope that more of that would be covered by insurance that would be held independently of the uh, reg fee. Yeah. Yeah, another question. As far as the priorities of the health service, I would assume that the, um, the bulk of students coming in would have a set amount of problems, either upper respiratory infections or either venereal disease. I don't know what the statistics mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And I, I would also assume with the priorities that some kind of preventative or health educational uh, uh, approach would have been attempted. And um, I didn't see any in view when I, when I went through. Is there anything being done in this area? <clears throat> I think much is intended uh, in this next year's budget. Um, I'm requesting for a full-time health educator to help the staff know what to do. You know, a lot of talks get about health education and what it really amounts to or how, it's, what, how it is most effective is still kind of a moot point. It's like saying, oh, let's do more preventive medicine. Um, but you know, when you, when you try to nail down an expert and exactly, okay, what effective preventive programs can you show me? Um, it's, it's awfully hard to say, here it is, and we're going to substitute this program for what we're doing now. Uh, one of the few you can point to is um, a conception counseling function. Um, if good conception counseling and prescription and, and clinical service were freely available to all students, uh, I'm sure that although it would cost something, it would cost them and other people less than the 18 abortions a month that we refer out. Um, you know, there you can say, if you do this, you are going to get a trade-off. It's an awful lot harder to, to say exactly how much health education is going to, um, if you will, prevent this or um, help that. A good health education program might result in, in greatly increased use, you see. In other words, um, all I'm saying, I'm not against health education, I'm all for it, but I think the assumption that you're going to substitute that for something else and save money or, or whatnot is, is, has to be very carefully thought through. Yeah, well, I, I, I raise this point because I feel it would probably, I'm, I'm not sure about the volume coming in, whether it would increase or decrease, I hadn't thought of that point, but I think on the whole it would increase the quality of what goes on there. I've seen people go through. I've only mm. been there once. I agree I've with you, yeah. from there as, as much as possible, you know, I'm <coughs> not a frequent there. But uh, in my experience going through, the education that went on was absolutely nil. And uh, if, I was, if I was a younger person or if I was uninformed about certain you yeah. Know, <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think, again, this comes back to the function of, of, of uh, 
I'll, I'll call it the panting syndrome, but I mean, it's just, you know, you got to hurry on to the next case because we got so many, and, 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 uh, right, okay, well, there isn't, you know, uh, the opportunity then for the kinds of dialogue which I think are the most important parts of, of health education, is what goes on between a, a person, a patient, any patient, who, who is there because they've got a concern or a question or a problem, and the person that they're talking with. Uh, this, oh, I think this is crucial and, and very central. To me, that is what, what health education really is, as opposed to, uh, you know, a little program of slides or, or brushing the teeth and so forth. But no, I, I'm interested in priorities, because this is really what we're going to have to do, is we're going to have to decide what are the most important things and go for those and uh, uh, downgrade or uh, uh, shift responsibility for some other lower priority things to other financial and other service areas. And uh, this is something I need to know. A couple other people have some questions here. Um, have the medical students been incorporated in the program as part of, as participants? Uh, <clears throat> not yet. I don't think they're ready, and I don't think we're ready. But um, well, I think they may be clinically ready. Um, I don't think there is any. Um, this is going to take time in terms of getting the school and their curriculum people and whatnot to say, yeah, this is an important part of their training, so we've got to liberate up time for them to do this, if even on an elective basis, and we've got to be prepared to have the time to supervise them. You can't just, I don't think you can take any trainee and just say, go and, and uh, work a shift. Uh, you know, unsupervised or and so forth. I'm all for it and uh, for the use of, uh, for the use and training uh, of various health professionals uh, to a greater degree than we have now. It's going to take a little time. he do? I'd just be interested in the endocrinologist. Well, the endocrinologist took and said, Ray, your analysis of blood test and, uh, uh, and a couple other different tests, but uh, he took a bunch of tests and he, L and he x-rayed my feet and, uh, and uh, that was it, you know, and he said, you don't have it, you know. But I was really surprised. I would have been much happier if they would have told me originally at the health service, well, look, I don't did you see it? In, did you see one of the the uh, endocrinologists? No, he just said this guy just said uh, I got worried about it. He, you know, they all said, well, he's confident. He knows what he's doing. He's the student health service doctor, and uh, he knows what's going on. And they said uh, we can't really you you was that was it in general clinic or uh, did you make an appointment? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, this was, I was back there like uh, five times, and they did blood test a week or a couple times, and they had me on diets and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. I never had nothing. You know, and like, you know, what if it was something, you know? I don't know what that, uh, what those drugs can do to you. I don't really know too much about it. It really kind of burnt me up, though. And I've really been really hesitant to go there ever since. Well, um, there's no sense in my fighting this because, okay, you know, it happened, and um, I'll say this, it's going to happen no matter where you are at some time, maybe not to you, but somebody. I mean, I don't care where it is, you can find a tale of of poor treatment or misdiagnosis and so forth. I don't know what the facts are. I don't know. You, you still may have gout. You may not. I don't know. Uh, you believe one guy. You don't believe the other. Uh, the important thing is that, that whether you're right or wrong, you certainly felt you didn't get treated right. And uh, you may not have. Um, again, I think when we can get enough people and pay them enough uh, you know, to, to guarantee the, the quality, um, we're going to be, uh, this is going to happen a lot less often. Can I just follow through one thing? You know, you hear uh, suggestions, well, why not junk the whole thing and uh, simply use the money to buy an insurance policy so you could go see your endocrinologist and so forth. You could uh, reg fee if you use the whole thing. If you use the entire reg fee, uh, it's it's doubtful whether or not you could, uh, you know, buy the kind of insurance that's going to enable you to go when you want uh, and get that kind of work done. Well, it's just like I really go to the doctor. I, you know, I do the best I can to stay away from doctors. Something like this is really Yeah, you know, there's some people who are never going to come in at all and who say, oh, gee, I'm always healthy. I never get sick. Um, uh, so why should I, uh, you know, I don't need a health service. I don't need a doctor, so why should I, I pay? Um, I think that goes right back to saying, all right, we'll leave it up to each individual to to pay for what he needs. And this means he's going to pay nothing, and some guy's going to pay 10000 bucks. If you're getting poor, if you're getting treatment or you don't feel you're getting a certain treatment, what avenues do you have in the health service to do anything about it? Who can you you know, can you say to someone, you sure can. You don't have to go see see uh, a given person each time. I, I told him I wanted to see another doctor, and he said, well, he's, you know, he's the one that treats those kind of cases, and he knows what he's doing, and they said, uh, you know, we really can't do that. You know? and like, Who said that? I, I called over the phone, and was one of the nurses who said, you know, we can't do that. Well, that's not true. In other words, they may have said this, but it, it, it shouldn't be true. I mean, anybody should be able to say, I, for whatever reason, I don't trust the guy, I don't like him, I don't think I'm getting the right thing, let me see somebody else. I mean, this is anybody patient's privilege, you know. Same what? What do you mean? Except him? Well, that's wrong. That is just plain wrong. Uh, Because I don't know any, you know. That's what's going on. Maybe you can't see it from your, Mm -hmm. wherever you Mm -hmm. work at, but that's what's happening. If I could have seen an endocrinologist within the school and knew I could have, you know, I mean, like, I'd rather see an endocrinologist that knows what he's doing at UCLA than pay 150 bucks. We have two of them that that spend a total of four hours in student health a week. Who are on the faculty, you know. Well, well, that's wrong. 
you know, that's, that's, that's bad. Now, those are the kinds of things I think we can fix, because, uh, um, uh, because that is just plain wrong and uh, should not go, go on. Uh, any patient has the right uh, to say, I'm not, it, you know, it is stupid to go to see somebody that you don't have confidence in yourself. He's not going to do you any good. He can be the most competent guy in the world, but if you don't believe it or whatnot, it's, it's a bum, it's a bum uh, scene, you know. But, uh, you know, these kinds of things, I think, uh, can definitely be fixed. And... Uh, service would be improved. Uh, first of all, I would like to know, what is the salary of staff doctors in the student health service? <coughs> the salary is a range. In other words, from a low as five steps, but for, um, for a, a physician without uh, specialty credentials, in other words, a, a GP type physician, and this doesn't you know, knock him because he can still be a good doctor uh, for for many things. Uh, that starts at about twenty three thousand five and goes to a top of um, I think it's twenty seven point seven thousand annually gross. With certif with specialty certification, he would start somewhere around twenty five and a half with a ceiling of uh, around 30. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but uh, for a, essentially, um, okay, a full-time, say, professor of medicine in the school here would be uh, grossing somewhere closer to 40. And we can't get uh, a lot of competent people to come in at those salary levels because they say, hell, I can, I can make 10,000 more than that starting out at uh, IBM or uh, the phone company or, or industry uh, or in private practice. So uh, <clears throat> um, these rates are up somewhat from last year and I think they will help us. But uh, they do restrict your ability to go out and, and, and pick, pick out a guy because you want him and say, here, you know, uh, you don't have much bargaining uh, room. It doesn't necessarily. In other words, it, well, it does. It, it, well, okay. What it what it, it it reduces to some degree your chances or the 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 bag the, uh, out of which you can recruit or out of which you get applicants. And you're more apt to get the retired or retiring person or the ex-military person. Um, and who, very frankly, are, are uh, maybe looking for something with a few less hours and, and you know, a few less responsibilities, as opposed to the somebody who really wants to take care of patients because he likes it and is good, good at it. Now, I don't say that, that we, we've got, some, I think, some, some excellent physicians there who are working at that kind of, um, kind of wage, but it just, your chances would be better, <laughs> I think, if you could pay more. Mm -hmm. and they're not, we're not able to recruit competent doctors. Many people feel are competent doctors. Um, so in the end, in the end, we're paying again because we're going to have to go outside and see a specialist or someone who we feel is much more competent. Or some of these doctors who hold part-time staff positions and you have to go out and see them on their office hours because they won't perform the type of do, uh, things that you need here at the student health service. Such and as? Such as the uh, allergy clinic, which is not here anymore. How many people in, in, at this school have allergy-related problems? And the school cut out the allergy clinic. We're putting it back. Yeah, but what happened to the people in between? See, we run into I'm not going to take any responsibility for what went on before. No, I'm not. Well, I'm not 
saying you should mm-hmm. take responsibility for mm-hmm. what went on. What I'm saying is these are some of the, the gripes that a lot of students have. We're paying, we, we have this feeling that we're paying for what should be quality care. We're not getting it, so we have to pay double because we have to then go out and pay on the outside market. Well, if you, if you feel you pay double now, maybe by paying about 25% or 30% more, we could get the quality. Yeah, as I say, a, a hell of a lot of it is just a, is just a matter of volume. And, and the fact that the program is determined not by what's right and what's good, but by saying, here is a certain amount of money. Live within it. You know, there's no way. There's no way you're going to do it. Right on, man. Yeah. That mean the the fee for service, like uh, what f- what which fees are you talking? Okay, suppose raise the reg fees ten dollars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, give them a third more if that's what they need. Well, this this is what I think is going to have to have to happen, and I don't think it'll be within the reg fee because to do that you have to raise it for the entire system, all at once, you know, for all eight campuses. Uh, and the regents are the ones who say yes or no. And uh, I mean, I'd rather juggle the al- uh, allocations of the reg fees instead of spending so much money on intercollegiate sports, spend more money on health. I'm all for it. But how much pressure does the health center put on? I don't think they've put a lot of pressure on before, and. Uh, uh, if you want to look at it one way, one reason I'm here is because I want to start putting pressure. Why, why can't they divvy up the uh, full-time salary pay that they do a the specialist and support some of the medical students that are in med school? In other words, pay them a stipend, you know, maybe five times, and that would enhance more third, fourth-year medical students to help you know, and be paid for it, you know, rather than hire one guy full time for two days a week. You can pay, you know, salary five times and help a medical student. And I'm sure he's just as confident and probably more confident than these guys retiring from the Air Force and whatever else. <clears throat> well, in other words, uh, by by buying buying a younger, cheaper uh not cheaper, I'm just saying helping a medical body, you could get more of them and so forth. I, I don't, uh, for a number of reasons, think that's going to work. Um, yeah, but you're, you're sitting up here being very negative. I don't, you haven't tested any of these uh, so-called things you think they're not going to work. So I don't, you don't have any basis by which to make that statement. You know? you know, I, I kind of think maybe you don't care being great but, but I don't, the thing that I don't bad see now. Is, you know, like, I would rather pay 35 bucks, you know, 10 bucks extra on my reg fee for good care than 25 bucks for garbage care. Because 25 bucks for garbage care is $25 wasted. For 30,000 students, do you think an extra 10 bucks, how much would that be? $30,000? That's a third more if they get 25. No, that's, that you're talking about uh, 10 bucks a student for 30,000, that's um, on a year, that'd be 300,000, you know, roughly $300,000. And uh, that's about the kind of dough we're talking about to... to uh, would that, would that uh, ameliorate some of the problems? I think it would. We'd still be somewhat restricted by the fact that, that even if we got more money for more competent and, and better doctors and nurses and so forth, I, um, we're going to have a problem of where to put them until we get a new building. And this is why we're planning a new building. What about the use of paraprofessionals? I heard you... Oh, well, we're, we're into that uh, to, to a limited degree. We'd like to go into it much more, again, simply to, uh, to make the skills that are, are the more routine or, or less complicated kind available to more people, uh, you know, by allowing uh, better use of the paraprofessionals. Well, here, uh, this gentleman presented an idea of dividing up a, a full-time staff salary between so many medical students who would, you would think are much more qualified maybe than, than paraprofessionals, people who, are, who can handle routine duties. These men could handle routine duties with a little more specialty, a little more knowledge than paraprofessionals. But you ever watched him? 
Listen, I, 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 I've just come off of five years of working in special health service in a medical school. And it was medical and dental students only, and nursing students. And um, I know fourth year medical students and third year medical students. Not until after they've been through an internship and usually for two or three years of residency, they're not. Schools cutting that out. Sure. Cutting what out? Internships, internships, and residency things. Stanford University Medical School. Has done what? They've reduced their no required year down to three years. Yeah, it's still three years. Reduced what down to three years? The medical curriculum? The time that they have to spend in medical school and internship, and I don't know the formality, but they've reduced the thing by one year. John well, Stanford used to be a five-year school before you got the MD, and then you had an internship, so they may have gotten it back down to four years now, it which is... Like you're being very negative. Well, the thing is, uh, I just have profound skepticisms because of, of uh, you say I have no experience. Well, hell, man, I do have experience. Yeah, and I would... You have uh, experience to come up with any solutions, you know? Your only solution is more money, you know? No, I've already told you that I think uh, an increased use of, of paraprofessionals, which in might include some medical students, but I would not think you could just simply uh, substitute the use of, say, medical students um, for other kinds of, uh, of care on a, you know, one-for-one one or two-for-one basis. Um, a lot of your medical students do a lot of their uh, work at the VA hospitals, you know, and they're not licensed yet, you know, free clinics and things like that. Uh, what percentage do you uh, feel that uh, are really major significant health problems that students avail themselves of your services down there? Oh, as I say, I think it's a it's a relatively small a small percent, uh, ten to fifteen percent of of all of the visits might be for something relatively more complicated. But, um, so the majority is like handing out pills and things like that, counseling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think a medical student could do that. You know, very if we can, it. if we can get them to, some would, some might be very good at it, and some might be absolutely miserable at it, uh, and think it was beneath them, think it was uh, uh, Mickey Mouse, and, and the whole bit. Uh, That's why the, too many medical students are elitist. Right. Now we're, you know, we're getting at something else there, too. Oh, okay. But if you offer them some money, maybe they, you know, that attitude will mm -hmm. grow somewhat, you know? Not saying it's Ken? Yeah. Yeah. Um, an issue that surrounds all these other issues is a, a feeling of community with, this, with the Student Health Center. That, you know, I've never related to it as being my, my health center. You know, as, as a mm -hmm. student, the walls are you know, are, are white, the, the desks are, are put in a position where there's no confrontation. Oh, it's a super, yeah. It, it's set up as if it's hospital cold. administrators, have, yes. you know, have run it rather than having some kind of student input. And it is different from a hospital. It's, it is for students. And you're talking about getting money, trying to provide services for students. And I think students should be involved in that. You're talking about looking for new resources, financial resources, uh, you know, professional resources and students. There's, you know, thirty thousand students right, who have right. who are more in touch with resources than you can get through your your own administration. Yet, yet I haven't I haven't felt that that students have been involved in, in changing or growing with student health or you know either philosophically or even when you're down there. You don't you know everything's being run around you rather than you know. With you. You know, I, mean, I would have hoped that this was at least one beginning, you know, or, um, that I that I agree with you, and, and uh, I don't see any way to go without involving students as much as possible in some of these decisions. Yeah, perhaps even and even uh, same money that you're asking, how can you utilize student funds? Well, if students made a decision on that, you would get your money immediately. Right, right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And they can't make a decision until they know what they want and are informed and, and are making a decision on some rational basis. And, uh,
Uh, yeah, this is another of the little games they play. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I'm being kicked out, but uh, no, I seriously, uh, and if I sound defensive, I don't mean to be because uh, um, maybe I need to be more educated too, and I'm, I'm prepared to be, and I really want to talk with anybody that has concerns. Otherwise, I don't know, and maybe you don't. So, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank <clears throat> you.